Hey everybody, Portland Chess Shop here to bring you the chess action, and I'm going to be showing you round number seven of the Gelfand versus Anand World Championship chess match played in Moscow, Russia, with a prize pool of 2.5 million U.S. dollars. So this is a big match, the World Championships. Anand is the current World Champion because he beat Kramnik, who beat Kasparov um, years ago. So. It's pretty exciting that they're playing a world championship, but the games themselves have been draws. Uh, the first six rounds, this is round seven, but the first six rounds were all draws, which, you know, is not the most exciting thing for, for chess fans to just see draw after draw. Um, I have heard some funny, some funny ways of trying to minimize the number of draws in tournaments, but... Uh, those sorts of new modern systems are not being implemented yet, so we have a sort of a classical system. Uh, both players able to prepare against each other's opponents. Uh, they have a team of seconds who research their opponent's openings and find try to find novelties, but at this sort of level, it's hard to find a decisive edge. Um, but this game, I don't want to give away what happened. I haven't seen it yet. I, all I saw was the result. But uh, I think that this game will be a little bit more exciting. We'll have some some uh, decisiveness. That's the, all the foreshadowing I'll give you. So Gelfand leads with pawn uh, up two, the queen pawn up two. That's d4. And Anon responds with uh, d5. So I haven't actually seen uh, what the has been played in the other games, but we'll just jump forward and see what's played here. So the this is a semi-slav, slav type position, depending on whether e6 will be played. I know Anand used this to beat Kramnik with the black pieces in their match. So the knight comes forward and the other knight comes forward, and now pawn is played up one square. Now uh, black has some options between uh, bringing this bishop out, which could be dangerous after things like queen b3 putting pressure on this square, versus e6. E6 is played, so now this is a semi-slav, and I do like these types of positions. My favorite positions here are where the queen comes here, the knight comes here, and then G4 immediately is played. And then, at, like, if the knight takes, the rook comes here, and it gets pretty complicated, pretty asymmetric. I played it a tournament once, and this was, like, a year ago when I was pretty rusty at tournaments, um, more than a year ago. Was it less than a year ago? Anyway, I played this at a tournament, and actually kind of got crushed because I didn't really know how to play it. Okay, so a6 is played, so we're not going to see the queen c2 line that I do like. So after a6, we see c5, and now th these squares are pretty weak. Like, b6 isn't really possible to uh, try to attack the center because uh, this a6 move has been played. So that would create multiple pawn islands, uh, and it's kind of a, just a little bit of a weak structure. So now we're prepared to see sort of a positional game in which black has, white has a little bit more space, on the queen side at least, particularly these squares, but black plays this move to try to break e5. If he could play the e5 move successfully, then I think he can uh, equalize the game. So the queen comes to c2, and we do see b6 pretty early, which is interesting, and then takes, takes, and the knight takes back. So now, if c5 can be played, then I think black could experience a good game. But black might need to castle first, but white might need to castle as well. And so this queen is on the c-file, attacking some of those squares. We do see the bishop uh, develops, and c5 is played immediately. We do see that Anand is down on time pretty significantly, so I'm not really sure where exactly in this line he wasn't expecting Gelfand to play something, because... Seems like Gelfand has been playing a little bit naturally, but while Anand has been playing, you know, uh, with the a6 idea, I think Anand's the one who's playing offline. So the rook comes to the c-file, c-file just, just seems important, and it's good to develop all your pieces. Now, white is like basically two, two moves away from completing his development, while black is more like one, two, three, four, five. So there's a sense in which black is down some tempos. Takes, takes, and the bishop comes here. Pretty good square for the bishop. This bishop comes comes out to g5. Now this bishop's pretty good on this square as well. We do see castles. Bishop comes out, so we see some, some rapid development by both players. Both players finishing their development. Pawn plays up, and the bishop retreats. And now this bishop comes out. Just try to complete the development. If the rook could come to c8, that's pretty good. You always want to put your rook on the same line as the queen. Well, not always, but 
pretty frequently. So white do, does cast. Now white has officially completed his development, while black is, I'd say, one move away from completing his development. So the queen moves, attacking this square. The queen is just kind of good on this diagonal as well as this line, but you know, not not amazing. So the bishop retreats, and the rook comes to c8, attacking down the c file as I predicted. Queen comes to e2. Uh, it controls some pretty good squares from here. Okay, so just some some good lines. Bishop takes, pawn takes, and the queen comes to d6. Now um, Gelfand looks like he's going to try to double the rooks. We see the time is about equal now, so Gelfand was thinking a little bit longer during this series. Maybe Anand had seen, you know, kind of deep and was was thinking, you know, about this sort of middle game position uh, all the way in the opening. So the knight retreats. We could see some possibilities for something like an e5, but it looks like that could create weaknesses for both sides. Uh, the rook, the rooks on the on the c file are doubled, which seems seems good. This rook is a little bit more passive than the, than these rooks, so it looks like White's position is slightly better, according to the computer as well. So now the knight comes out here, uh, trying to trade rooks so that these rooks can be on the open file. Open file means that there's no pawns on this line, uh, on this column. And so yeah, th it's good to have your rooks on the open file. This knight decides to come forward, and that seems good. It's good to centralize your knights. Knights control really a ton of squares from the center of the board. That was a mistake, but. Knights are really good in the center. That's why he plays it here. You can also see that it's defended twice uh, by the bishop and the pawn, attacked twice by the bishop and the queen. So we see takes, and bishop decides to take, which I think is a little bit unusual. Now this bishop could take, etc. And now this rook is on the open file. So there might be a little bit of a, a tactic in this position, like if bishop takes, pawn takes, pawn takes, queen takes, then maybe queen b3 attacking the bishop, the knight and the pawn. And maybe this pawn. But I'm not sure. So the queen decides to come to c2. Doesn't take this knight immediately. Seeing that maybe it's a little bit of a trap. g5 is played. So Anand is now down on time. He took some extra minutes to play this move. And the move looks like a critical critical weakening of the king side. It look maybe Anand is a little bit frustrated with his match against Gelfand. Hasn't been able to have, you know, a serious edge in his games and now he's playing for a win in a position where he should be playing for a draw again uh because yeah, it just doesn't make sense to be attacking in this fashion creating critical weaknesses in your base for after this move. It looks like the computer likes queen c7, which I think makes sense. It's going to f basically force the queen trade. And after the queen trade, there's going to be this kind of gross structure. Queen c7 is played, trading the queens. And now pawn up. You can see Anand is down on time here. And they have still 15 minutes for the next uh, 15 moves. They'll get more time at the 40th move. And it's the 25th move now. So Anand, who's often a speed demon in chess, he's known for playing very, very quickly. He is down on time in this position. So now we do see takes, takes, and when Crafty thinks that this is basically a decisive edge for white after knight d2, f5, knight c4, knight f6, and then knight c5. This knight comes forward. Knight d5, that's knight here, and then uh, rook c6, and basically the c file is just is just weak and the knights are really strong etc so the knight comes back f5 is play the knight comes here very strong knight pretty pretty centralized also has possibilities to become even more centralized and is defending you know key squares as well so that's a good knight so this knight comes to f6 now this knight comes forward again so it was a knight on the rim which is dim but now it's attacking multiple squares um, and really constricting the opponent's Position. So I do like these these centralized knights. I think that they're very strong in this position. And this bishop looks terrible. It is attacking its own pawns. So the knight comes to the center. You can see that according to Crafty, White has a pretty serious edge in this position. Two pawns for just in positional just in positional measures. 
So the rook comes off the open file, which you know might not be perfect, but it could be good enough. And the knight comes forward. The, now this knight is centralized again, having some, some serious possibilities. It looks like this knight could take on a2, but knights on the rim are dim, and it just could uh, there could be some some more serious problems. So the knight comes to c2, attacking the d4 square. Knight comes up to c6, both defending d4 and attacking this rook. Rook takes on b2, rook c7, check, king over, pawn up. This is kind of desperate. You can see that he's actually just sacrificed his bishop. The game is basically over at this point. Takes, king up, and check, king back, knight retreats. According to the computer, this game is basically over. It looks like there must be a mating attack in this position. And so Anand, with only two minutes left against Gelfand, hoping that this pawn could queen, which would be pretty awesome. But it looks like knight takes e6 is going to lead to a forced mating combination. Knight takes e6, and white wins. There's a resignation because after rook check, king takes, queen queens, king back, the best he has is queen takes e5 because if he plays anything else, not sure what else he would play, but let's just say he plays like really greedy, then there's definitely a mate. Come on, Crafty, show me what the mate is so I don't have to figure it out on my own. That's rude. It looks like it's just check. Now the king is forced to go here. Check here is mate. So that's the checkmate, and that's how uh, Gelfand... Pulled ahead in the seventh round of the World Championship match. Gelfand is ahead, which means that he could beat Anand, which I would be very surprised if he beat Anand. And it would not really be... I mean, it would be kind of ridiculous, I think, because Gelfand is, is not nearly the best player of the world, you know? I mean, Magnus is probably the best, but he doesn't want to play for the World Championship yet. And, you know, I think that Anand is, is one of the best players, so I would really prefer to see Anand win and then Anand you know could play Magnus or, or something like that in a future world championship I don't know so I, you know I favor Gelfand but congratulations to Gelfand for playing really well and if you like this video please give it a thumbs up I really appreciate it it helps me get more views and more views means more happiness more chess more checkmates so appreciate it thanks a lot until next time Portland Chess Shop later